This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. What if science took into account all the things that can't be measured or quantified? What if hallucinations were real? What if all of the information about you was your own private property to sell? This is Unregistered, and this is my interview with Daniel Coffeen. So I'm in my favorite place in San Francisco, the home of Daniel Ooh. Coffeen, yeah, yeah. the great Daniel Coffeen, uh, place to be. known to unregistered listeners, known to Renegade University members as our, uh, what do I call you, the, our grand wizard of philosophy I'll and, take re- that. and rhetoric? I'll take that. I'm a sophist, but I'll take that. Are you? Yeah. What's a sophist? Sophist is, well, I, I can tell you. You want to know what a sophist is? <laughs> you brought you it up. Know? <laughs> what is this? Uh, I like sophist because it has, you know, in history of philosophy, it has this, uh, you know, great pejorative connotation, right? Because they're ones who don't believe in truth. They right. just try to teach you to, to persuade. I've been called a sophist. Yeah. yeah. And so I embrace as, it. As an epithet. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I call myself a rhetor, a rhetorician. Okay. Right? As opposed to a philosopher because philosophers seek to build a system in which to derive absolutes, which is derived truths, right? Well, rhetoric is never concerned with such things. Begin right. from a different perspective, right? And ask, what does this do? What are the effects of this? How does this, what does this inaugurate? What, ask different kinds of questions. Mm-hmm. And so a sophist is, is, a, is a practicing rhetorician. Interested in language, not at getting at the truth. No, not at fixing problems. Interested no, in no, the no, play no, no, of no, words. No. Oh my God, no, not at all. Oh my God. No, oh my God. So you, you, you conflate it all of a sudden, getting at the truth and fixing problems. Those are may or may not be inclusive or exclusive of each other, okay. right? Um, now, the sophist will always, it depends on the problem. If the problem is you're trying to derive truth, that's fine. Okay. But rhetoric always comes to the situation assuming that there is, there are all kinds of things to ask of any situation. And that you can't separate the mechanics and the expression from the expressed. Mm-hmm. Right, that they're all intertwined, mm-hmm. and that language and, and is, is is always already social, right? Yep. It's always already part of um, when I taught uh, rhetoric at Cal. I taught the introduction to the lecture, and it was supposed to be the introduction to the uh, to the major. Yep, and it was supposed to be all about syllogisms and all that crap. And I just it's so uninteresting to me. So the title of my class was uh, the art and practice of circumstantial propriety. What does that mean? Meaning, um, I love this idea of a protean standard, right? So philosophy is always after um, absolutes, mm-hmm. right? What is, you know, the Kantian uh, moral imperative, yeah. right? Some rule that can apply across all circumstances. Everywhere and at all times. Exactly. No matter what. The, the Ten Commandments are a great example, right? Mm-hmm. You shouldn't want to fuck thy neighbor's wife, no matter what. Even if you guys are madly in love and her husband, no matter abuser, when, no matter yeah. where, no matter, right. just don't, no matter stoop, who, don't right. even think about her, don't even covet her. It's like, really? <laughs> Thou shalt not yeah. so stoop. Yeah. But there, there are all kinds of circumstances in which coveting one's neighbor's wife might be a good, healthy, vital thing to do. Mm-hmm. So, but, but it doesn't mean um, one of the great sort of uh, fallacies of, of philosophy is that if you get rid of standards, you inaugurate chaos. That's it. Um, but rhetoric, and in fact, a lot of postmodern philosophy, Deleuze, Foucault, they come in from the other side and say, no, 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 you don't eliminate them. You actually proliferate them. Mm. So rhetoric, there are rules all the time. You're always mm-hmm. feeling them out every single moment, mm-hmm. right? So it's how do you know when to reach for your drink? How do you know when to reach in for the kiss? How do you know when to say something? How do you know when to leave the room? 
you're constantly feeling for the right thing. It's collaborative, it's emergent. Mm. It's not dictated by any one party, it's fundamentally ecological. Mm -hmm. But there still is a time, you know that. I, I, the one I always think about, I don't know why I always think about this particular example, but sitting in like a sauna, you know, is a great thing, you're sitting in a sauna and you're, you're waiting for that moment, you're not quite comfortable yet, and then there's, a, there's an inflection point in which you're pervaded, right? The heat has changed you fundamentally. And then shit starts to get a little weird, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a point at which if you stay there too long, things are going to get ugly. You get scared too. Yes. I do. Yeah, absolutely. At a certain point, right? There's going to be this other, uh, another inflection point. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you know when to get up and go? Right. Right? And then there's, of course, social politics. You're maybe you're wedged in. I go to the Kabuki hot springs here in San Francisco. There's all these naked men lying around and you're way up in the corner and all of a sudden you're a little woozy and you might fall. You don't know what you're going to hit. And you're, yeah. How do you know that right moment? It's this weird combination of the social, my body, time. And just because I've done it before, 25 minutes is always the time to leave. doesn't mean this time it's not 18 minutes okay. or 17.5. Meaning even for myself, there's no absolute continuous rule. I'm in flux. The social's in flux. Um, the, every event, every encounter is an emergent collaboration, right? That's inflected by history. I've been in a sauna before. I've been in the situation before. So I know at some point if I stay here, it's gonna get ugly. I'm gonna get dehydrated, I'm gonna pass out. I may die, I may vomit, all kinds of things might happen. Um, I know if I leave too early, I won't feel quite saturated. I still have a kind of uh -huh. itch. Um, so I'm looking for what in rhetoric is called kairos, mm. the propitious moment. Mm. And in classical rhetoric, kairos was this goddess. Oh, we talked about this with Venkatesh Rao in an episode just a few weeks ago. Okay, right. Kairos was the god of a different kind of time as yes. opposed to Kronos. Yes, exactly. Kairos, will you tell me how you well, interpret I, Kairos? So Kairos in rhetoric was always this propitious moment, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And right. Um, A moment of opportunity. Moment of opportunity. Okay. A moment where something comes. And it's, it's a couple, the two examples I always give to think about Kairos. One is um, the gunfight scenes. Think about the good, the bad, and the ugly. It keeps flashing between these guys' eyes, right? Mm. What's the moment you draw your gun? How do you know when to draw? What's that opportunity? You're looking for that moment where you get to step. And it's imperceptible except to the gunslinger. And it's contingent on the social. And everything that's happening right then and there. Is, is that right? Circumstantial. The, the other gunfighters. Yes. The other people involved in the scene. Exactly. Okay. Oh, and it's okay. circumstantial. And therefore unpredictable also. Yes. Unpredictable. You don't know beforehand, right? Right. Yeah. Um, the other right. a great example, of course, is in the dating world. And one of the... Huh. One of the um, beauties of course of of dating of romance is when do you make that move when do you bust a move yeah you're looking for that opportunity yeah. and one of the things that disappoints me about a lot of what's happening in uh, uh, campuses with consent is it's gonna get me all kinds of trouble but of course it takes away kairos right you're not a, you're no, no longer considered liable for assessing the emergent logics mm. You have to stop and refract, refract it through some sort of abstract logic, right? The yeah. logic, first of all, there's a logic imposed yes. before the encounter right. by the institution right. or by a, some moral code, right? right? You are supposed to ask or make a move at this point and not any time else, yeah. right? Right, that's Kronos, I yes, suppose. Exactly. That's living according to yes. Kronos, right? Yes. Kairos is, as you're saying, a sort of contingent, social, always changing, emergent. Emergent. Uh, time. I suppose, or a way of telling time, or a way of yeah, thinking about time. Or time. Yeah, it's a way of thinking about time, but Kairos is not just time itself, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a moment. In time. That's, you know, and so for the classical rhetoricians, mm. Kairos was usually, would come very rarely, and it was always this big thing, like now is your time to mm. strike and kill Caesar. In modern rhetoric, which is what I am, mm -hmm. Kairos is every moment. Mm -hmm. When do I shut up and, and defer to you? When do I reach for my drink? When we're making these, these things are always sort of emerging according to sort of almost like chaos theory. There's an order there, mm -hmm. but it's only visible or, or, or can be known after the fact. And yet we're always acting. So Nietzsche, you teach about Nietzsche for us and you've yeah. done a lot of work on Nietzsche. Like he talks about the big moments, seizing the moments, oh. opportunities. He talks about Kairos in these ways, maybe not exactly yeah. this way, but... Well, he was a rhetorician. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. And so, but is this, is this how you read Nietzsche too? Or... 
Yeah. I mean, well, well, no, sorry. Yeah. Do you read him as the modern version? Do you read him as there are always being these emergent moments of yeah, opportunity? I mean, Nietzsche, Nietzsche was... I, I'm not so sure, actually. Yeah, I'm not so sure because he was so disdainful of me sitting in the hot tub or the sauna deciding when I'm going to get the fuck up to yeah. leave, right? Uh, he would he, say what? He still has a grandiose. He just wouldn't care. Mm. Where I kind of care. I love these little moments. Mm. I love that moment. I love... it. To me, it's far and away the most interesting thing about, um, about dating is when is that moment? What, what, reading it, right? I mean, that's the <laughs> yeah. only thing really that that's almost salvages the uh-huh. horror of having to deal with other human beings <laughs> is, is, is negotiating um, these sort of propitious moments. The example I always give, I used to always give, was um, in classical rhetoric, uh, you had Fred Astaire, right? Everyone's on stage, or he's on stage and everyone's looking at him, mm-hmm. right? And he dances in a set environment that's um, special. It's momentous, right? The modern rhetorician is Gene Kelly. He dances alone out in the rain, on the street, in a tenement. He dances any moment whatsoever, anywhere whatsoever. Spontaneously. Yeah, and it emerges. So he's, he's walking yeah. down, the, down he, the city street and he, he'll dance anywhere and anywhere. That's right. And he's creating, he, he's choreographing as he moves. Exactly. And he choreographs as he encounters new space, yeah. new objects. Yeah, right? exactly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, one of my, my, I don't even remember what film it's from, where he's, I've maybe only seen the clip of it, where he's, he's in like a burnout apartment, some tenement, and he does an entire dance with a old newspaper. Mm. He's like kicking up pieces of it, uh-huh. right? Anything can be your partner, yeah. any moment whatsoever. Yeah. Think about Gene Kelly versus uh, Fred Astaire. Yeah. The special moment versus every moment. It's not that it's special, but that is a moment of reckoning. Uh-huh. Right, the sort of micro reckonings, uh-huh. um, and that once you begin um, thinking in terms of kairos and thinking in, in terms of emergent propriety, it's not the absence of propriety; it's that it's emergent. Right. That, so it is there, but it's always multiple and it's always perspectival. Right. So rather, and, and you know, uh, Deleuze will talk about this in Spinoza: the difference between morality and ethics. Right, so, um, and Foucault does this in his History of Sexuality, volume two, is he, he looks for that moment at which Greco-Roman senses of propriety become Christian, right? So for the Greco-Romans, it was never, you know, don't, um, don't fuck boys. It was fuck the right boy at the right time. Mm-hmm. So there was something you could do wrong, but I can't tell you beforehand what that is. That's right. Right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's no, you know, always be prudent when you're eating. But it's, it depends what prudence means. It's a, it, it's a protean standard. And it's so con- it's not the standard... And it's contingent. Is that the right word, too? Yeah, it's okay. contingent. Yeah, yeah. It's ecological. Yeah, yeah. But it's still a standard. So the idea of a protean standard, mm-hmm. which is a phrase I steal from my friend, the poet, Lauren Green, in his great book, Poetical Dictionary, um, where he wrote a dictionary according to a protean standard. If you look at a, a classical dictionary, each word is defined according to the same tone. Right? So butterfly, euphony, fascism, gnat, concrete, they're all spoke, they're all, the definition is all written in the same voice. Mm. It's all this sort of monotone oh. that tries to evacuate any perspective. Now we're getting neutral. Now we're getting into caffeine territory here. And so at Lauren yeah. Green's book, he wrote a dictionary in which it's a true dictionary. It only has about 40 words in it because each one is complicated, but, and it's a true definition and pronunciation, but each word is defined according to its sense so his definition of glee oh it's gleeful right <laughs> acrobat if you read it and read it out loud it plants its landing purple is purple bleak oh, bleak is bleak right okay. so the whole definition emer- is is contingent on the sense of this word sense. there's no neutral voice outside of it and so sense is inclusive of both meaning and this other thing, this sort of uh, mood or affect. Affect. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. Now you're okay. Now you're Daniel Coffin again. Okay. Now it's all coming together here. Okay. Now how are you a sophist? So the sophist is the one who who operates in a world of emergent circumstantial propriety, as opposed to one who operates ever seeking. So when I read something or engage with something, I don't want the fucking right answer. I'm not looking for that. I don't want to know what's true or right. I want to know what do I do now? What happens here? How, what action will I take? How will this serve my vitality? How will this 
please me? How will this mm-hmm. make me healthier? How will this, what will it do? It's all about you, to, huh? Is it true? <laughs> it's all about you. Well, no, it's self-interested. Yeah, maybe, yeah. It's, it's individualistic. It's individualistic, sure. Yeah. Because it's perspectival. I'm liking it. I'm yeah. just saying. No, absolutely. You would be criticized by many people. Well, in, because it's perspectival. Especially in this town for saying such a thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a very conservative town. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's right. I, I, never, I, never, I never did San well. San Francisco's a conservative town. Most conservative town I've ever been in. How? What do you mean by that? It's a town of bigots. Are you kidding? You try to say anything. Keep going. Try to say, um, I, I don't believe. Uh, here's one that happens to me all the time. I don't like traveling. Nothing, <laughs> nothing liberals love fucking more than traveling. And especially, especially apparently women on dating apps. Have you noticed? They've all they been love, every, to every country. And they're very proud of it. Oh, yeah. I told, told you, I don't know if I told you my... I will not date a woman who puts anything about oh, yeah. traveling on their app, on, the, on their profile. It's yeah. not. Got my passport at the right. I don't care what they look like. They could be the most amazing woman in the matter. world. If they talk about traveling, sorry, honey. So I had to tell you a story. When I was on this date with this woman, and <laughs> it's the first date, and travel comes up. And I know at this point, based on circumstantial propriety, that this ain't going anywhere. <laughs> so I got nothing to lose, nothing to win. It's just, just, okay. I'm kind of bored. She's not very interesting. And she starts talking about travel. And I, I couldn't, I knew it was going to be provocative. I knew, but I still couldn't resist. I was like, yeah, why do you like to travel? And the look of horror on her face, like, what kind of animal was I? And she said, well, I, traveling expands my worldview. Expand. Right. And I couldn't help it. What did you say? I said, well, clearly not enough to, to, to understand people who don't like to travel. <laughs> I guess your worldview wasn't that inclusive, right? To get that expansive. Oh, God. Yeah, she left before I paid the bill, before the bill came. She really? Was out the door, yeah. Oh, dude. Now, I don't even know why I had to pay. She should have had to pay. I mean, yeah. That disaster. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, there's a certain... Okay, so sophists are playing. This, is, this would be both, I mean... Some people would see that as a criticism. I see it as a, as a great thing. What know, do you mean but, by that? What do you mean well, by play? you're not like, you, you said you don't give a fuck about like the outcome, finding truth. Like, well, those are again two different things. I do care about the outcome. Uh-huh. The truth and the outcome might not be related. And in fact, that's what Nietzsche keeps coming back to. It's like if, if, you, if people who like truth were actually interested in truth, they'd be confronted with this merciless, mm. devastating, sublime horror. Mm-hmm. You don't have uh, an overarching objective. Right, exactly. Not predetermined. That's it. I don't have a plan. Exactly. The modernist, yeah. the modernist, yes. right, wants to build the Hoover Dam, you know, wants to, you know, go to war in a foreign land to conquer it, right. wants to solve some mathematical question that's been here for ages, yeah. right, wants to, you know, discover a new species. Yes. Right? Yeah. You, that's not what you're about. I mean, you're not opposed to that stuff. Yeah. And there are rhetorical approaches to all those things. Okay. But it's not, it's again, whenever there's any kind of standard of behavior or standard of knowledge or um, again, reading a film or reading a book or it's not, you know, one of the, um, I can't remember who makes this distinction between teleological yeah. and teleonomical. Teleo- tele- teleology is what we're getting at right. here. So right. So teleology is yeah. moving towards a telos, a purpose, an endpoint. An end. Teleonomy would be what I'm talking about, hmm. which is you're always going and you're always going the direction you're going, mm-hmm. but it's not predetermined. You're neither lost right. nor found. It's this, it's why a figure I come back to a lot is the middle voice, mm-hmm. right? It's, and we don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of vocabulary in English to talk about this middle position. Okay. Um, the Buddhists talk more about it. I was going to say, this is reminding me of wise mind yeah, in, exactly. mind, in mindfulness. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And so that sort of middle position where you're neither active nor passive. Right, so do okay. nothing is the why, right? The, right. For the sophist, or at least my caffeine sophistry, mm-hmm. um, we're always already positioned in this middle voice. And one way I think about that is think about perception, let's say vision. Um, is it, I used to use this example for my students all the time. When I'm looking at the glass, am I looking at it or is it coming to me? Right? From a certain perspective, vision is totally passive. Mm-hmm. I'm just getting inundated I, you, you the whole fucking world is filling me up I, you can't help mm-hmm. it and if you start thinking about it it will freak you the fuck out mm-hmm. right like stop coming in my head stop coming at me right the other side is no no i look i'm the i'm the object yep right and i can see something i'm the subject and it's the object yeah, yeah. i will own that thing right. in looking at it and you determine it but then you get merleau ponty a great french phenomenologist who says no it's a chiasm it's intertwining that which sees is that which can be seen 
I can only see the glass because I'm, I, have, I am the same stuff as the glass. And to see is a kind of palpation. Mm. And if you think about sight as touch, it seems touch more explicitly breaks down the boundaries between subject and object, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm touching you, you're touching me, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean it's parallel. Doesn't mean they're equal, right? Clearly, I'm, you grab somebody, it's different than two people holding hands. Mm -hmm. And yet, if I grab someone, they're still touching me, right? But that's the same of vision, the same of all senses, right? The whole perceptive event is always situated in this middle position, in this middle voice. Okay, so you have a choice you're facing right now. Do you want to talk about sex or drugs? Oh, do I, have to, I really have to choose? Yeah. Your, your two favorite things. <laughs> yeah, <I love> you <laughs> describe yourself as a drug out of pervert. <laughs> So uh, I figured that would be... Well, know, sex, I'll be honest. We'll, we'll talk yeah. about both, so don't okay. worry. All right, you know, let's talk you, about you, drugs. You, drugs. Drugs seem safer. Let's do drugs. Yeah, okay. Sex is only going to get me in trouble. Right, okay. So we're going to talk about sex, too. Yeah. So um, you have written on your blog, an emphatic oomph, the great blog, my favorite blog. Although it's a title you don't like. I, you have to change the title right, the, of the overall blog. Yeah, right. that's You're very true. kind. Thank you do, yeah. Um, but the blog I love. So you wrote a piece... A blog post uh, just a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah. On hallucinogenics. Yes. Psychedelics. Yes. And you have extensive experience with these drugs. Yeah. Enough. Yeah, but I have enough. I, I don't know if extensive is the right word, but yeah. Yeah, you're, you're drug addict. It's all relative. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about like how long you've been doing drugs, what kinds, and your general That's fair, experience. Yeah. And yeah. That, in fact, I wrote that because. Your drug biography. What is it? Yeah, that? I mean, I started taking, I started by, you know, smoking pot, and I don't know, I was. Eighth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, I don't know, mm -hmm. 12, 13 years old. Mm -hmm. I just took to it, right? I mean, it was good. Um, and, but I also knew how to use it. I've always been a good drug taker like that. Like, hmm. I don't, I was never the sloth sitting there ripping and bong hits in the morning. I mean, I've done all that, but it was never, that wasn't never my thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I always found pot, so I still think pot is in a way the, the prince of drugs. Really? The prince of psychedelics. I thought yeah. you were a little bit down on pot. No, I love pot. It's just okay. a challenge. This is what I love about okay, it. Okay, okay. Right. Yeah. Pot is just great at revealing, um, I think, a lot of uh, the micro mechanics of the social. Huh. I, I, I can see how I'm acting in a relationship. I can see relationships over time. For so, me, that yeah. came off. At first, it was paranoia and hyper self consciousness, yes. Yes. which I hated. Yes. <clears throat> That's why I stopped smoking yeah. it for 30 years. And then I got back into it just yes. a couple of years ago. And now I see what you're saying, yeah. right? It's now that I'm. I've gotten, I think, unfortunately, because it's been destigmatized because it's now legalized. I'm sorry to say the state got into my head. Yeah. But I do think that's why I no yeah. longer get that paranoid when I get high. Uh, that's interesting. I know. It's fucking the state, man. That's funny because that actually kind of bummed me out. You know, I did not vote for. I don't, you I don't voted, know. you bastard. Yeah, we don't we can talk about that. Okay, we'll get to that. I did vote for the first time. But I, um, Jesus. I would not have voted for the legalization. I knew the state getting in. Involved my pot was a problem because it was de facto legal. I've never I, tried to get pot. In prop no, prop seventeen in this in this state. Yes. I voted against it too because I could read it and I said, it said we will give the industry to the corporations we select and no yeah. one else will be allowed in. It yeah. almost says that explicitly. Yeah, it seems so it's like a two paragraph yeah. resolution. I was like, you're kidding me. It's so plain. So I voted yeah. against it. Yeah, it seemed. All right, so we. So, but then, but then I discovered I did I did LSD uh, my junior year in high school and fuck, it was something, man. It was fucking something. You know, and then I get to college and, you know, I had a pretty steady diet of LSD and mushrooms. Um, you know, and then there were some other drugs that were not that interesting, like crack cocaine, which was big in the 80s in Philadelphia. It was very easy to get, but it was so uninteresting. Um, it was fun, but it wasn't interesting. Um, and, the, and then I, I got to a point with psychedelics that I was like, I got, I, I felt like I was done. Mm -hmm. Right? I remember my... I remember my second to last trip, I was at a dead show in Philadelphia. It was summer, I'm hot, I'm outside. And I'm like, I'm on the floor, which I never went. I'm agoraphobic and misanthropic. I'm never down on the ground. It's a big outside stadium, <laughs> down on the floor. And, and I'm like, this is so delicious and so grotesque and boring. Wait, you hate, you hate the outdoors and people. Yeah, yeah. So there I am, like on the floor at the show in Philly. <laughs> and I just, I just remember just shooting up through the sky and being like, I am done. I, I, I know, I know, I know things. I don't need the drug. And then I had one more trip after that, at that period that was just epic on the ocean. And I felt, um, felt like I, I felt like I'd reached a point where I understood what I needed to understand, which was a certain flow. I mean, what I see now is what psychedelics, unlike pot, I think with weed, people really 
the parody is people think about big issues on weed. But that's not what weed is good at. Weed is really, hence the paranoia, it's really local. It's Horizon about, point. Yeah. yeah. It's about, it's for not me, it's that, about myself. Yeah, it's yeah, not I, that far I, I become inward looking. Okay. Um, so but then. the horizon does not go, you know, again, the stoner is supposed to be sitting there wondering about the cosmos. But that, to me, that's not really what happens. I, I can read the TV show really well. I can see all the mechanics yeah. of how the movie was put together. The psychedelics I've been interested in, so LSD, mushrooms, and um, I'm going to say MDA, MDMA. Um, I know people don't consider that psychedelic, but I do. Um, it, and they all, in different ways, do different things. I don't think psychedelics are about different paths to the same place. Okay. I think they all are a different thing. And different DMT, education. you've done DMT too. And then DMT, which yeah. is sort of a different beast. Yeah. Um, but I'll include DMT in there and say what they do is, is um, they just shift your horizon point, right? So that, whew, and this is something I've been sort of obsessed with over the years, is just depending on what, you, what your focal point is, what your horizon point is, mm. your whole sense of propriety, your whole sense of life changes. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you're mm. looking out and you see these buildings and you see men and women and you're like, I, I want a job and I need to date, that, and that's your horizon point. And we all know people like that. That's where the horizon begins and ends. Mm -hmm. right? Or that's at least a parody. I, I don't know people like that, but I assume there are people mm -hmm. like that who really <laughs> care about their job and <laughs> care about their dating. They're, they're out that. there, I promise you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so the horizon is just a super limited point. I get it. Right. That's what they think their world is. Right. And so, of course. But then you can shift up to the sky and you can shift, you can keep going, right? To the solar system, to the cosmos, to yeah. all time, always, and all time and space. And what I've found those drugs to do is shift, it, they, they dramatically shift my horizon point. So I don't do self-examination because self-examination is absurd. It becomes this ego, egotistical thing, right? It kind of unplugs me from my self-examination and just says, Shh, none mm. of that matters, don't. I don't have to think about all that. Whether she likes me, doesn't like me, or I don't have enough yeah. money to make my rent. Really? It's okay. There's the ocean. There's a, a cosmic becoming that you're just flowing through. You are matter, continuous with great cosmic becoming. I'm just, I am, I am, you know, what's the great Joni Mitchell song? You know, uh, we are gold dust. Uh -huh. We are three million year old carbon. Um, and that's, to me, what, at the most sort of general level, the psychedelic experience has done for me. It's just displacing ego as a, as a as a as a central point ego is the issue here yeah is the problem it doesn't have a problem it, but yeah i think ego well, gets gets you gets leads to anxiety and which and psychedelics is the solution or a I solution think so, yes no shit i think so i mean because ego the way you describe it here has been identified by many other kinds of people as a problem right yeah. blocking us from doing various things yes. right it just it's but psychedelic drugs not often prescribed as the solution. I think they rupture and they yeah. they just shift your point of resonance. To me, it's almost it doesn't need to be some big mystical thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was writing about in that blog post, is that psychedelics for me are not we can, you could couch it in mystical language, but to me it's a kind of radical empiricism. You're participating in or can literally see mm -hmm. and participate in things that are happening right around you that. Um, are generally just not considered. I mean, you're making an epistemological claim too in that piece, right? Completely. Which is really, I think, the main argument in there, isn't it? And that's yes. the most radical part, which is the hallucinations are not just hallucinations. They're not just made up. They are really happening. Yes. Yeah, I want to, I mean, there's something so interesting to me. I mean, just completely nonsensical about a hallucination is seeing what's not there. Yeah. I mean, how do you even parse that sentence? It doesn't yeah. make any sense. Because you are seeing it. It's there in some... It's, it might not be there materially. It might right. be there quantifiably. But, but neither, it's there qualitatively. But neither is an idea. Exactly. Right? Have yes. ideas changed the world? Of yeah. course. Exactly. And so you're seeing things that are there that you just don't... It, it, secretly, that piece was a rant, which has been an ongoing rant of mine, against science, which... Our scientific method. So you want you want to classify it as a phenomenon? Yes. What you see in a yeah, hallucination? Exactly. You want to classify it? I've said. Exactly. So within phenomenology, it would be something that could be studied. It exactly. should be studied. It should be studied and part of knowledge. And what, right. what, what's so interesting to me is the way science and religion somehow have duped us into thinking they're opposed. Boom. Where they're 100% going after the same thing. They all have a disdain for the body. They all go for an abstract truth. They all ignore the 
unbelievable wealth and breadth of data and information that's around us all the time that is fundamentally ecological, mm. qualitative, affective, affective, right? That can't be, we always assume Social. that affect is, is subjective, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's perspectival, but it's not subjective. To take Daniel's course on Nietzsche or to talk to him one-on-one -on -one via what we call office hours, go to renegadeuniversity.com. To attend the Renegade University Weekend in Oakland and San Francisco with Daniel and me, which is April 24th, 25th, and 26th, go to renegadeuniversity.com slash live. So I'm reminded when you talk about this of Foucault's whole argument about how discourse never takes away, it never subtracts. Yeah. Repression doesn't really happen. There is no such thing as a repression that takes things out of the world, right? The attempt to repress sexuality just creates new language about sexuality, which we then glom onto and then yeah. creates its own discourse and its own reality and its own yes. meaning. Like the, the classic example is homosexuality was not a concept until the late 19th century. Then they invented it and then people were like, oh yeah, that's me, I'm homosexual and this is who I am. And then it went on from there. And so I think it sounds similar here that yeah. with psychedelic drugs, yes, that you are, these things that you're seeing that are not tangible, not manifest in the physical world, can't measure them, a real new form of discourse. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yes. New, yeah. and you said it's a new horizon, a new way of thinking and about yourself, about the world, but it's a new, new words, new concepts, new languages. Well, I mean, there's the experience and then there's how it's accounted for culturally or discursively. Right. Right. But the hallucination itself is a form of discourse, no? Oh, I see what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. Um, maybe, except discourse I always see as, as, as a, an emergent social thing, right? It's, it's oh. between amongst people, right? It's the definitions of what, uh, the limits of what can be said and not said. It's the constitution of what counts as the true, what constitutes. Wait, why wouldn't, I want to dig into this. Why, yeah, is, yeah, why yeah. isn't a hallucination a new form of discourse like, and, in, Foucauldian, in Foucauldian terms? It seems as such an emergent um, idiosyncratic figure, right? That is, that becomes almost um, purely phenomenological, right? That it's just, you're confronted with this thing. But it doesn't mean the terms of how it's... How, because it's not deliberate? That's why you want to say it's not discourse? It's not talked about. I mean, discourse is that which is talked about. I mean, okay. So discourse, I mean, the, normally the way we think about this is, you know, uh, points of light, sounds come into our heads, right. we perceive the senses, then we make sense of it. Right. Okay. We fashion it into language or concepts or feelings, and that is disc what we call discourse, in oh. our, right, in our world. That, yeah, I think so, we're but, using the word differently. Which yeah. is just yeah. sort of the, the, the mind's mediation of right. the outside world, right? right? But, and, but so with hallucinations, yeah. there's nothing coming in from outside necessarily. It's all coming from inside. But the mind is creating mm -hmm. something. The mind is creating something new, something brand new in the world. No, but I want. There's a lot of things there. So one is I'm not sure but, okay. that a hallucination is seeing is coming up. It's it, it's coming out of me. Yeah, it's coming out of an encounter with me with something. So it's not social. Uh, it might or might not be social, but it but it, it's not that it's just. I might see demons from my childhood or something like that, which mm -hmm. is what I might call a subjective, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but the perspectival is a perspective on my localized perspective on some kind of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Discourse I always see as the sort of social laws dictating the flow of how something can or cannot be sort of figured semantically yes. um, in terms of any sort of value, social value, semantic value, okay. significance, right? Um, so. What I, I think what's beautiful in a way about often for people in the psychedelic experience is that it ruptures so much of discourse. And so they don't know how to situate it, mm. right? It, it becomes, you know, Foucault's word, or world or words, it becomes sort of monstrous, right? It doesn't fit anywhere. It becomes madness. It becomes a thing that doesn't fit. Mm. Um, as opposed to beginning, what I'm hoping to do is begin to create a discourse mm -hmm. of these kinds of data points. Okay. These kinds of experiences, affect, is, is constitutive of discourse. I want to, I want to infuse discourse mm -hmm. with the things that it normally excludes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, you, but you are, you're, you're targeting, a, I think, a particular kind of discourse. I don't think Foucault differentiated between scientific, rationalistic discourse and affective discourse. I mean, you think, for him, it's all... 
But for this, I, for me, Foucault was always talking about discourse. Is it, are the terms of the are the, the rules in which anything can circulate, the value it has in its circulation, its social circulation, okay. in which you are figured as a subject. Mm -hmm. But that the the I think the beauty of Foucault is always his experience outside, right? Which he loved, right? Which is why he likes going down to the the eagle and getting ass fucked the while he wears the a fucking bandana, <laughs> you know, um, yes. you know, like that was his to, joy because it, to put it gently, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, you're supposed to, you know, he taught in my department long before I was there, you know, he taught in the rhetoric department. Oh, 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 for like a year, right? Yeah, yeah like I really always wore white leather pants. I don't know, it was before my time. That's right, of course. I don't know why I love that. That's right. Um, but discourse to me is the, is not the limit term of that which can be said and thought, it's the, it's the constraints upon which Things that are said and thought are figured and situated. Okay. okay. So the hallucination resides entirely in your mind until you... What? It's not entirely I'm, in your mind. I'm, I'm agreeing with you, I thought. I know, but it's, just, it's, it's outside the discourse, but it doesn't mean it's outside... But once only you... Only contained to my mind. But I'm saying, then once you... If, if you articulate it then yeah. to others, yeah. socially, then it becomes part of discourse, does it yeah, not? Yeah, or even my... Even, okay. Yeah, or even I'm, I'm, I think what makes people troubled is you're, you're having an experience. Mm -hmm. You're like, I don't know how to situate this, right? It doesn't have a place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's why people like me fat, when I started reading Terrence McKenna or Deleuze and Guattari, it began to have a discursive home, a place where this kind of experience could be figured and had value as opposed to just being monstrous, scary, outside, disruptive, yeah. at a positive value. Yeah, uh, don't you describe it as a process of discovery? Hallucinating? Um, sure, I think so. You, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're finding new things rather than rather than just hallucinating about stuff that doesn't exist. Oh, right. Yes, absolutely. It's always okay. there. There's no such thing that doesn't exist. There's something you can't hallucinate something okay. that doesn't exist. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It, right, now, is it a discovery or a creation? Again, this is another argument postmodernists yeah, have, right? Yeah. For me, everything's a creation. And right. I, that's how I read Foucault and Derrida. Like, everything for them is a creation. If you're discovering it, you're, it's presupposing it, that something exists outside of consciousness. I think there are. I think it depends. I, I don't think it has to be one or the other. I think it depends mm -hmm. on your posture towards the thing. So I'm sitting on this rug. You see this red rug down here. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting with my friend, and it's pitch black in the room, and we're smoking a DMT vape pen. You're talking about an actual experience you just had? Yes. Which you just wrote about. Yeah. In, oh, it wasn't, too. it wasn't even a vape pen. We were smoking changa. Yeah, right, right, which was a bunch of herbs mixed with DMT. With DMT, you were smoking yeah. DMT. Smoking DMT, but not just straight DMT. So, so you're not just blasting off. Yeah, it's, no, thank you. So but it's okay. more yeah. of a. And, and, you, and you wrote about this, by the way, in your yes. blog. I read it. Yes. Okay. And and it's pitch black, yet somehow we can see, and partially that's ambient light, and mm -hmm. partially your pupils are dilated, and yeah. partially uh, you can just see things at a different wavelength, mm -hmm. which is what I'm beginning to poke at at the at the notion of discovery. Okay. So I noticed these strands floating through the air. And I'm like, huh. You know, because, you know, I'm old. I see shit. I don't know. And, but I'm like, huh, look, I, 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 but I could hold them. And then I'm sitting with my friend. And I was like, hey. And he could see them, too. There was no issue. It wasn't like, oh, that's weird. We just took them and we could pull these, these little strands of light or I don't know what they were. You had the same hallucination. But it wasn't a hallucination is what oh. I'm saying, right? So it was what... That's just what I would say was discovery. There was something there that we don't normally see. That you wouldn't have seen if you weren't tripping. Right. Really? And this is why, yes. This is, what I'm, this is where I was headed. Now you're like in UFO territory. This is where I'm headed. Yeah, 100%. Oh, you really? Wow. So you really think there's... So it is discovery. This is like... Yes. Oh. So this is what I'm so saying. So this should be like in, this, in the science building. We this is what this I'm saying. Yes. It's scientific. I don't know if I like this anymore. So what I'm <laughs> saying is that between... We, we, we see ourselves as objects or subjects in the room situated... Um, with these sort of positions. And that between us, what, what right now, between us, what, what, what's between us right now? Uh -huh. What is this? Occasionally, little um, flecks of spittle. <laughs> I'm a spitter. I'm a spitter, yeah, absolutely. Just occasionally. Yeah, yeah what else? None of them hit, have hit me, by the way. What else? Uh, I mean, air. I can, I can smell the, the beer and tequila you're drinking down here. Yeah. Um, what, uh, lots of feelings. Lots of feelings. Mm -hmm. So uh, Merleau Ponty says that the it's infinitely dense. It was, it was Leibniz actually. It goes back to Leibniz, right? Yeah. The sort of inventor of the Baroque, right? Of, of the world that's of the plenum, the plenum. Yeah. Like one of my favorite fucking concepts. And that once I I, I figured the plenum, everything changed. What's for me. the plenum? Define the it. Plenum says 
If we say the earth, the world, the cosmos, the universe is a plenum, it is full. Mm. It means there is no such thing as nothing. It is full. It doesn't mean it can't keep going. You add more, it just keeps, it is always at its limit, but its limit is always changing. Mm -hmm. But there is no empty space. Mm -hmm. Right, and so I guess there's a famous book I don't know about this debate between Hobbes and Boyle mm -hmm. uh, about I guess 17th century about the uh, the possibility of a vacuum. Right, and I'm just again I might be making this up. This is my memory from grad school, um, but that you know uh, Hobbes was a planist who argued that there's no such thing as a vacuum. Right, the, between me and you, there's infinite. This is infinitely rich. Right. There's as much stuff between yeah. me and you as there okay. is in you or in me. Mm -hmm. And boy, I was like, no. He happened to, I think, invent something that could create a vacuum. So, you know, following Trotsky or Adorno, right? You follow <laughs> follow yep. ideas that come back to profit motive. Yes. Uh, he wants to sell his vacuum machines, and so we we began to create a scientific method premised on establishing knowledge in a no place. There it is. And knowledge in a no place, nice. to me, might have some effective value, but I, it seems to me fundamentally nihilistic. Mm -hmm. Knowledge based on something that can't possibly exist and saying that which is true is that which I can establish in a place that can't possibly exist and in which human life is, is annihilated. What's the place that can't That's possibly exist? Uh, okay, uh, which is the place of logos, right, and rationality? Oh. Is that what you mean? Well, no, I mean, I mean that, that think about a, this, the lab. Scientific lab yes. tries to create these sort of these conditions in which the subjective or which yeah. I mean they make everything white. I, yeah, I'm right. Somehow white. So science takes yes. creates a place. The scientific which, method right. creates a place where nothing, where humanity, human beings can't exist. And quite literally create a vacuum. And that's, they say if you right. drop if oh, you drop right. a, a, a cannonball and a feather, right, it's sterilized. It's right. you know, and they they all fall these, they fall the same pace. The, the external like world is forced out. Exactly. That's right. The world is forced out. And think about that's the right. will for that. The will that says I'm going to know the truth Ooh. by getting rid of the world. Ooh. Well, that's that's nihilism, what? right? Who are you? What kind of will is that? That is it. That's, that's a devastating critique of science. Yeah. Jesus, Daniel. Well, that's Nietzsche. I know. Well, but he, he didn't say it's it like that. It's me extenuating, uh, pushing. Yeah, where, does he, Nietzsche, where does Nietzsche say that? He talks about truth and religion are the same thing because they both seek the truth. Yeah. He doesn't but, talk about the vacuum. He no, he doesn't do that part. But he implies it's that, that there's a nihilism to Damn, science. Damn, I was, feeling, I was feeling pretty good about science recently because, you know, I, was, I was interviewed Donald Hoffman at UC Irvine just a few weeks ago. And he's a neurocognitive scientist. Mm -hmm. He's a scientist in the yeah. science buildings yeah. at UC Irvine, right? Yeah. And he was saying, physicists now are sure that time and space are going to be anachronistic, that there is something outside of time and space, that we're going to be thinking completely different thing, differently oh, about yeah. everything. Like that. And they're into this. And yeah. I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. A yeah. scientist is admitting this. Yeah. He also said to me, a scientist, yeah. That no scientific theory has ever been proven, not one, not one. I love that. So yeah, I was exactly. feeling all good about science, yeah. but now you're. Well, you're my problem with science is that it, it, <laughs> that it's not empirical. <laughs> that, if you be, that if you begin actually being empirical, you you That's start so taking funny. into okay. consideration things that can't be measured. Okay, so right. So so this is this right. is the Daniel Coffee in one hundred and one. This is right. m pretty much the subject of your book, right? Um, and. Let's, let's be clear about this. And this is what you're going to be talking about at the Renegade University weekend, too, I think, at least in part. It's about seeing the world differently than we are trained to. Certainly in politics, you know, in the world I come from, intellectualism, you know, and this goes for the humanities, social sciences, the sciences, right? We are trained to, uh, to evaluate the world uh, through logic, rationality, reason, et cetera, right? Right, right, right. right. Okay. Which can do some stuff, you know, you can build a bridge and, you know, you can probably stuff, yeah. organize a big company that way or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, a military loves that kind of thinking, right? And it's quite effective in certain ways. But that is a very particular and narrow form of discourse, of yes. communication, of seeing, of, yeah. of feeling. Making sense. Of making sense. There yes. you go. That's your yeah. phrase. Yeah. So, and you're saying there's all this stuff, as you were saying before, between us and between yes. people and within a social yeah, milieu yeah. that goes and on. That, and that we're all um, sort of ecologically figured. We're mm -hmm. contingent beings, right? Mm -hmm. So, the, I mean, the very constitution of my subjectivity or my perspective is already enmeshed with other things. 
right. right? I'm made up of other things. I am a grab bag. I am a, I am a remix of mm -hmm. the world, right? Mm -hmm. Quite literally, I, we all have skin, but I, my skin is this way, right? right? So we're remixing the world as a, it, locally according to all sorts of metabolic functions, right? So are you saying that science cannot predict this conversation? Because science is all about predicting, right? That's, how, that's their... Except what's funny about science is that's where they is get all their credibility is when they predict things. It's so it's so historical based too though. It's so about how, they can't. what's already happened, right? That it's mm. never open to the emergent, right? It's all about shutting down. Mm. And I would love a science, and science at its best is actually radically empirical, not just quantitative, but qualitative, and actually accounting for empirical. That's why I think Terence McKenna so for the is a great scientist. So you want scientists to account for the affective as well. Like my friend's uh, poetical dictionary, like a dictionary, have knowledge right. take into consideration other things besides that which can be measured. Okay, how do how does a scientist? I mean, I I, I would love this. I'm all for it. But how is this going to happen? How would scientists take account of things that can't be measured, and how would they well, then factor that into their equations? Yeah, I would change everything. We change the methodology fundamentally, and maybe even right? the questions and, they're asking. Exactly, and so that's why that's. I realized the article, Different questions. the blog post I was writing about psychedelics, about being empirical, I, I, I realized that what I was talking about was the ancient shaman, who, that we, the, the splitting of the poet and the scientist mm -hmm. and the wise man, all, that's a relatively recent phenomenon. Right. Right. And, and I think I realized afterwards that I'm probably talking about something that has already existed. Yeah. In which one person was all yeah. these things. Oh, you know what Donald yeah. Hoffman said? Um, I love this too. He described all the great theories, all the great scientific theories, as being beautiful. Oh, it's a man after my own heart. Right, yes. I know. I mean, he said primarily that's right. what they are. They're be I think it was the first word he used yeah, to describe them. That. They're beautiful no, that's theories. A, that's what's real science is. He's empirical. Right? Because he's counting for beauty. I think Eric Weinstein says that too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not that I'm a, it's, it's a, it's a dominant, the fact that we can talk about science as, as it or they or science mm -hmm. as already lets you know that it's trying to abandon any positionality, any perspectivalness, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. say, well, it's just this institution well, according to science. Um, and I, I don't mean abandoning it at all. It is, a, it is a way of making sense of the world, but I think it could be radicalized. I think the way we've ghettoized and say, well, poetry is over here and art's over here mm -hmm. and science is over here. I think is doing us a great disservice, especially today, where people, you know, I, I, I think the, the claims we want science to have are both um, sort of impossible and absurd, right? So I'm uh, reading Bruno Latour's book, uh, who I don't know well, so I've just started the book. But he's going on, a, he's, he's really trying to address people who are denying uh, climate change, mm. right? And he's saying, well, on what grounds, right? So you have science, a bunch of scientists get together and they point out all kinds of data. People are denying it, but are like, well, where's your proof? Right? They're like, but it could be these other things, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And science is in this funny position, right? Because, like, like your guy said, there is no theory that can finally be proven. Right. There is no such thing as proof, because proof suggests finally the end, some self-certainty, something that is so self-apparent I don't need to talk about it anymore. It just is. Right. But that doesn't exist. Right. Right? So science has put itself in a funny position, right, of, 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 of maintaining a kind of radical rationality yep. that is being used by the opponents of its position against itself, right? Saying, well, where, oh, come on. Right, where's the proof? How do you know? How where's, do you know? Where's the proof of climate change? But both of them are the, beginning from the wrong position okay. of, of assuming there needs to be proof. We make decisions all the time, back to Kairos and mm. the propitious moment. I make decisions all the time, not just based on... Um, some rational accounting of the facts. There's so many factors. Decision making and how we understand and believe things is such a complex calculus. We're not rational agents. We're, rationality is one very important mode of decision making. Uh -huh. But it's one mode. I mean, any beginning fucking rhetoric 1A student knows there's ethos, pathos, logos. Yeah, do that. Right? So do, there's... Do break that down. Yeah. So that, I don't even know. It comes from Aristotle, right? Yeah, but yeah. it's... You know, every argument has a, has a part of it that is logical. Mm -hmm. This is the reason to do this. This is the steps, meaning it's derived from some master principle. So the logos. Okay. There's the pathos, which is the pathetic claims, the emotional. Mm -hmm. I just like it. I just love it. It makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. And then there's ethos, which is from what position is the person speaking? What's mm -hmm. their authority? What's, authority can be complicated because authority doesn't have to 
in some environments, having a PhD works against you. It's not your authority. So it's not just it's what is your authority. Right. Right? Because it's always situational. It's always perspectival. So what is the position of this argument? How are you coming at me? Mm. Are you my friend? Are you my the expert? Are you the... What are you saying to me? And there's logical moments and there's pathetic moments or emotional moments. Mm -hmm. Now, I, you know, Eva's Plato's Logos are useful and they're, they're nice, they're key elements. But it's even more complicated because there's all kinds of cosmic forces, right? I mean, anybody who lives in San Francisco, I assume in the world knows this, you wake up and it is a thick gray fog outside. Mm. And you're like, whoa. It's weighing down on you. <laughs> and it's weighing down your mood. It's weighing down on your body. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wow, I should feel good. I, 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 rationally, right? I got laid last night. I, I, got a, I, I like the job I'm going to. I don't have to go to a job. Everything's looking groovy. Mm -hmm. But you get this mood, right? And mood is so complicated. I don't generate my mood. My mood is generated in my participation with the world around me. And that is a kind of knowledge. And it's, again, not subjective. Mm. It is perspectival. So does this body in this place, in this time, in these conditions. Um, we, it's, there's something called seasonal affective disorder. We mm -hmm. know that there are these other conditions that Im implicate and inflect the things we believe and think and say and do. One of my favorite quotes ever you know, is Emerson, you know, our, our moods don't believe in each other. <laughs> right, because a mood is so absolute. God, yeah. And you feel good and you're like, oh yeah, everything. I, 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 you, you'll have some philosophy. And you'll have some beliefs and you'll say some things to some woman or your child or people on the street. Yeah. And the next day you have a different mood and you have different beliefs yeah. and you say different things yeah. and you don't love that woman all of a sudden. Or, <laughs> and I, I, I want mood to become a figure of knowledge, right? To be figured in the epistemological landscape, okay. included within scientific discourse, Whoa. as opposed to always exiled. And I don't know what knowledge begins to look what, like at that point. Uh, what does the process look like? That's what scientists want to know now. That's what a bunch of listeners want to know well, right now. Well, so, so I, I, I go back. I think one of the great practitioners today is this guy, Lauren Green, who's written two incredible books. One is Poetical Dictionary, mm -hmm. and he talks about the methodology in the beginning. And then he wrote a second book, which is a textbook called Atmospherics, mm. in which he tries to delineate the sort of concepts of affect within experience. Mm. And um, in the Poetical Dictionary, you know, I, I talk about this a lot in my book because it, what it does is once you introduce affect and once you introduce um, this sort of breadth and wealth of data into your data set, it changes your posture, it changes your ethos. Mm -hmm. So rather than the classical scientist who's, who, who dresses in white and you don't really want to know him, mm -hmm. except he wants to put his name on something so you can get a grant, mm -hmm. but it's somehow his knowledge is not him. It's not contingent on him. Right. right? He's, he's different than his same, knowledge. Same even in history, yeah. you know, in Absolutely. anthropology, in political science. That's what we're trained to do is to separate ourselves. I was just talking about this with someone. Yeah. I know, and, and Nietzsche knows, that they are autobiographies. Right, right. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nietzsche says this very famously, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know they're autobiographical, okay, but there's no mention of me, my family, right. anybody I know, anybody I've ever known is in these books, right? It's right. all, it all, in fact, in 99% of the book takes place before I was born, right. right? It's about American history. But yeah, I'm all up in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So here, so. So we can't, to, so, to understand how and why I wrote that book in the way that I wrote that book, you would have to understand all the affect, all the stuff, all the my my context, my my world, my well, feelings. Well, it's, it's there always indirectly. My moods, right? you know, the weather, right. the weather in the Bay Area when I was growing up, you know, here, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely, <laughs> sure. But now think about the posture. So the so the academic or the scientist is always after the definitive. So you go back to dictionaries. Yeah, I have I have the Oxford English Dictionary. That's definitive. Right. The Webster's unabridged. Right. What. Or Lauren Green introduces in the Poetical Dictionary, it's not the book, it's just Poetical Dictionary, is this fundamentally different posture mm -hmm. of never seeking to be definitive. It will never have wanted to be definitive. It will always be, I am one amongst many, because it's always perspectival. Mm -hmm. So let's make the knowledge feel as rich as possible. Rather than owning one dictionary, let me own 500 dictionaries. Mm -hmm. Let me have a multiplicity of positions. Mm -hmm. So the book that he and I talked about writing a long time ago was getting a whole bunch of people, or one person could do it if I was Borges, but a book of cosmologies. 
right? And in fact, I wrote a cosmology at some point, right? And I was waiting for everyone else to do it. Imagine a book of cosmologies. So this book is like, everything is bodies and events. Another book comes along. Says nothing. It's all just wind and smoke. Right. Each one is true from its perspective. Uh-huh. They're all they are often mutually incompatible. I'm thinking like for Hegel, it's the great yes. ideas of the time. For Marx, it's material exactly. conditions, and that was their big fight. That, right? These are cosmologies, theories of the whole world and how they work. Exactly, right? and that's how I've always viewed philosophy. And so, so rather than having a discussion trying to get to a truth, okay. I see them as an exploration okay. of multiple worldviews. Yes, well, just, sure. Just different worlds. Mm-hmm. So I don't see them as any conflict. I might or might like, people ask me, why don't you like Hegel? I'm like, I like Hegel's fine. I don't believe Hegel, but that's, that's irrelevant. Right. It's, it's, it's like surreal. There's, He's like a great comedian. He's like Charlie Chaplin. It's like there's the DC universe, there's the Marvel universe, yeah, yeah. and then there's other universes, right? Exactly. Okay. And you roll with it according to all and, kinds of... And you are just as uncommitted to any one of them as you are to the Marvel and DC universes, I, I assume. Yeah, and you get more you're or less not, attracted to things. You're not like a partisan things, right? of one or the other. But I do get attracted to things, so I'm well, yeah, more yeah. attracted to Deleuze and Guattari than mm-hmm. I am to Frege. Sure. Or, or whatever the But fuck. you don't think one is more correct or better yeah. in some moral way just, than the other. It just other. feels right. like, yeah, I like, I like snuggling in bed with them. They smell good. I like the way they smell. I like the way they taste. But see, again, they're going to come back at you, the modernists. are going to yeah. say, you're just playing games. You're not serious. This is not serious work. Well, you know, so uh, Nietzsche has this great phrase he uses to describe Plato. Or, it's Socrates, not even Plato. He says, Socrates is the great progenitor of, of serious play. Uh-huh. And I, that's just such a great figure. Hmm. Right? We can't separate the two. Right? And that's why I asked before what you meant by play. So play mm-hmm. when it's opposed to the serious or the true mm-hmm. or the state. Or, right? But when play becomes constitutive, yeah. what is more serious? I mean, I, yeah. to me, always the person who's adamant. The person who is so self-serious about their philosophy or their way of life mm-hmm. is missing the point altogether. And this was the Socratic position, of course, right? So Socrates is walking the streets of Athens, and every, you know, sanctimonious douchebag on the streets like, I know what the moral is, mm-hmm. I know. He walks up and he keeps asking them questions until, until they, they fall apart. Yeah, until right. they abandon ship. <laughs> right. You know, he's a nudge. And right. that's why Nietzsche calls him a nihilist, because uh-huh. he brings everything to zero. But he also introduces irony which is a, a, a lighter hold on any position, on any adamance. And this is something I will talk about mm. um, in, in Are You Weekend? Okay. Which is how, once there is this proliferation of positions, this is something I've been talking a bunch about on Twitter recently. I, I look at my Twitter feed, and every, there's all these different, radically different positions, yep. and everyone's so fucking self-sure. Yep. Everyone's so serious. Yep. Doesn't anyone go and go, oh, look, there's a multiplicity of positions. Maybe I should hold my position with a little less bile. Mm. Right? It does, and it doesn't mean abandoning passion. Right. And it this just is means diff- abandoning being a fucking douchebag. <laughs> yeah. And this is different than something I don't like, which is humility. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not the Christian the humility you're talking about here. Yeah. Right? No, Good. It's the opposite. Oh, it's, how's it's it like the Nietzsche. It's Nietzsche. Ni- the, 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 Eke Homo, the chapter, title chapters are why I, why I Am So Wise, Why I Am So Clever, Why I Write Such Good Books. Because this is my position, and you own it completely, but it doesn't mean it's your position. Or the right one. Or the right one. This is, this is the fucking world. Live in my world or don't. Why do I care? Okay. So do you bring this up on the first date or the second date? <laughs> how do women respond? Well, how do women respond to you? <laughs> How's that for a change of topic? <laughs> so for people who don't know, Daniel and I are of the same age and we've both been online dating you for longer than I have, but I've been doing it for almost a year now. And and you're the only friend I uh, I talk about oh, this yeah? with. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, you're the only person I know. All my friends are married. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and right. so people and people don't want to hear about it. Right. For various reasons. Oh yeah. You're right. right. That's you, a good point. Have you experienced this? <laughs> yeah. They do not. Care. So I feel so women yeah. don't want to hear about it. Right. Like female friends, they right. always say you should learn how to be alone. You should not be doing this at all. Everyone every, says that to me too. Every female friend. Every of mine, single one. Every one you of them. Should get in touch with you and use always in caps. <laughs> Every woman I know has told me, you should not do this. You should learn how to be happy just with yourself yes. alone. And I say, I'll take it under consideration. And then I don't bring it up with men because contrary to popular belief, men don't talk about this stuff. Locker room talk doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. Except between you and me. You and I do. Yeah. We, we talk a lot. Occasionally of- one of my married friends will ask for like a really sordid story. And then I get into it. They're like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, right. They're like, yeah, yeah. And now you... <laughs> and, and you... You're such a disgusting pervert. Yeah. You have written an entire novel <laughs> <laughs> a 
about your your, your fantasies as a professor. It's not even essentially. a fantasy. Oh, well. it's, yes. Uh, okay, keep going. All right. Well, is it not? No. Yes, you have. Yeah. Yeah, you revel in it. I don't it. know if fantasy is the right word, but yes. Yeah. What, what what would be the right word? Experiences. Oh, right? actual experiences. Yeah. Oh, that's all real in the novel. Well, no, it's a novel. <laughs> all right, we went I'm over not, this. I'm not, I'm it's not, all it's I'm all not telling you it's anything. all the same. It's all one continuum. Exactly. And, right. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, like, you know, I have, I have issues out there, right? You know, know. thinking the way I think, yeah. you know, having these ideas, um, being, you know, not just politically incorrect, but just being in my head in this way all the time, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. you know, civilians don't think this way, right? I mean, it's a good word for it. 90% yes. of Americans wouldn't even begin to know what we're talking about. It's not, exactly they wouldn't right. have the first clue. They couldn't even, ev- they couldn't <laughs> ever even enter this conversation. Exactly this, right. this podcast will never, ever cross the ears of 90, at right. least 90% of it. It has no chance at all, in other words. Right. Right. The other 10% is divvied up between those who listen to watch MSNBC, those who watch Fox, those who listen to PBS, those who listen to Joe Rogan, and then the very, the tiny little leftovers are people like me. But anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah. but nonetheless, when, you know, the dating world, yeah. right? These apps, you know, OkCupid, Bumble, what do you like the best? Oh, I don't know. I can't, I always forget which one I'm on, so yeah. I had someone tell me, yeah. actually it was Warren Farrell on, yeah. the, on a podcast recently, not on the podcast, but he told me afterward, he said, make sure you go on Match.com. Yeah. It's been proven that those always, that Match.com results in the longest lasting relationships. It's yes. much better than the others, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what you don't the care. criteria is to begin with. Yeah, no. I, that's, okay. Yeah. So, but you know, so we're in the dating world out there. We're like out in the, yeah. it's, America. It's a comedy. America. Yeah, I mean, it's you a and tragic I, like, comedy. You and I, like, yes. exposed to America. Yes. Like, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. <laughs> that you and I are like, we put our face. It's us, a farce. Here we are. It's like, a farce. And they yeah. look at us and they're like, yeah. what is this? Yes. You know, they don't even know what to do with it they right half the time. No. How do you, tell me about your profile, your dating profile. What does it say? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Say, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know what to do. I, so I, there's certain knowledge is affect. Well, there are certain signifiers that you can you can try to push out there that you think might have a certain valence in the in the local economy, right? Yeah. So I just double down on. I'm a New York Jew. I got a big fucking nose. I'm going to talk about Nietzsche. Big fucking nose. And I'm not going on a hike. And I'm going to fucking drink. <laughs> and I'm going to curse. And so, what you do, what I get, are so a certain people, number of responses. So like, for, ooh. for people who don't know, yeah. who are not uh, on dating apps in the Bay yeah. Area. Everybody on dating apps in the Bay Area, uh, they talk about hiking, travel, and red wine. That's what, at least all the women. Every, every single one. Every single one. Every single one. Every single one. So <laughs> my, fir- my easiest rule of thumb is the minute they use the word adventure, it's five left. Five. They use the word adventure, they're gone. Get the fuck Because if they want adventure, I'll show them a fucking adventure. And they're not, they're not going for that adventure. Right? So that's going left. <laughs> yeah, the red wine thing. I love Napa. I love getting wacky with my girls. That goes left. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, no one's swiping on me, except I, I clearly not, not satisfy true. I satisfy a certain you, sort of fetishy who he seems like this kind of thing, he's a smart. And then what inevitably happens is they're like, oh, he wasn't kidding. Well, he is just kind of a solitary pervert, alcoholic, drug addict, <laughs> lunatic who talks about Nietzsche and masturbates all day. You know, so I get, a, I get like <laughs> two weeks. Really? Well, that might not be no. true. So you've had long-term relationships. I, I know this. You've had long-term relationships. You've had a fiance out of this. I've, I've fallen in love. You've I've had fallen in love on the on the. You've fall, you have fallen in love. Yeah, twice. Twice you have fallen. Twice in love. since my divorce. Ten years. From, fallen in love twice from the internet. From the from people you met on dating apps. Dating apps. with people you met on dating yeah. apps. Twice you fell in love. Twice. Huh? Yeah, it's something, right? That's why it's, I can't really be that critical. It just means <laughs> it gets thrown back on me to be discerning, right? So. I don't go on a lot of dates because it's, it's so easy. It's like, nah, right. nah, 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 nah. It's a beautiful thing. And then, and then I go on a couple and you either get a little something off. And to be fair, and not to be fair, to be clear, mm-hmm. many of the women I've gone out with, even if we don't become anything, I'm still friends with. Like, yeah. I've met some fantastic, and, and the fact is I just don't hide what I am. Mm-hmm. And so it's right out there. Mm-hmm. They don't always believe it. So they're always, some of them are a little disappointed. They're like, oh. They think secretly, I must like hiking or travel. It's like, yeah, not so much. Or he doesn't like to drink that much. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Or he doesn't curse that much. Well, uh, and those people, that's easy. But yeah, it's, it's, I've never really fit. I've been in the Bay Area almost 30 years, 29 years. I don't have one person in the city I call to go out with. Not one. 
Wow. Not one. Why? Where people I enjoy, I go out and I run into them. So why? Um, this is not a city that enjoys irony. <laughs> that enjoys gesticulation. That enjoy. It's a very conservative, bigoted city. Oh yeah, you said it's conservative. It's yeah. very. So if you're not of a certain ilk, mm. I was out with a. Uh, I, I ran. I dropped my kid off the other day, and I ran into my old neighbor, my ex-wife's neighbor, and we we're talking. And another guy pulled up, a neighbor, and we we're all talking. And somehow they all brought up the election, which is always my biggest fear. I'm not a voter. I don't read. News. I've read newspapers since I was 19. I, I just, but you just voted this time. I did vote this time. And I can talk about that if you like. Just because he's Jewish? Is no, because he's that fucking what it is? interesting. Did they call you up? The, the International Jewish well, yeah, they, uh, Organization? They well, yeah, yeah, because our stock went up in value. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you're being a good Jew. And uh, he, I don't know, somehow some conversation came up and then someone, he said something and I said, I said, I don't know. I said, to be honest, if I were a voter in the last election, if I had to vote and I was a voter and mm -hmm. it was between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, of course I would have voted for Trump. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, to me, that's so self-evident, right? But like, just because it's interesting. Well, okay. Yeah. Entertaining. You're yeah, in it for the entertainment. Yeah, it's entertainment. Yeah. I'm going to vote for some me too. neoliberal hack who's going to yeah. recapitulate the entire system. I'd rather someone disrupt the system for better or worse. Good man. Than just recapitulate the same old yep. exploitive terms. Okay. Like war machine. So that's why you're voting for Bernie. Um, or you did vote for Bernie. I did vote for Bernie. He's disruptive. I think he's, he's a character. And he's, he's coming, you know, and, and part of me is, comes from a, I, I do have a fantasy of a socialism that works. Mm. I, my mm. my socialism is, is so non-paternal. And unfortunately, nothing like living in the state of California to make you hate socialism. Um, you know, make, somehow the state of California has decided that they know better than me and my son about how long he should go to school. Like he's not allowed to drop out. I go to jail if my kid drops out of school at 16. New York, you can do 16. Mm -hmm. Why there's any age at all? I don't know why they think they're in meddling in my family business. You sound like a libertarian, man. Yeah, it's very confusing to me. Um, yeah. No, but I'm an anarch. I'm a commie anarchist, crypto you are. pervert. That's exactly what you are. That's exactly what I am. Yeah, know. drug addled too. Yeah. Back to back to love. But I do want. Uh, <laughs> but I do want the state to take care of shit for me. I want them to pay for my you home. Do? I want them to leave me. The, I, if I could just. That's not here, leaving you alone. You want the state to pay for your home? If I don't, if I don't have to pay. I deal with asshole landlords, yeah, and I'm going to deal then with... Then you, you won't be dealing with an asshole landlord. You'll be dealing right. with the mayor or right. the governor. I, I hear you. Or That's, the king. Hence my ambivalence. Okay. But in my fantasy, <laughs> if I didn't have to stress about... The fact is, right now, the economy's tanking. My landlord's going to kick me out. Mm. I might not be able to live near my son. Mm. He can't drop out of school, so I have to keep him here. I've been there. And in public schools... I've been in exactly the situation. I'm, I'm in a very uncomfortable situation. And, I, and to me, the social could have been organized in a different way. Okay. That this didn't need to be the case. Let's... I, we do... I want to finish by yes. talking about your solution to the world's problems. Yes. Which you have. And we're really serious. I do. The crypto. Mm. Duh. Hello. Oh, yeah. I you, forgot you, about that whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Oh, <yeah. laughs> you're going there. Yeah. We, I do want to finish. But I want to get back to the, to the dating and the love thing, you know, because... Yeah, you know, let's go there. Yeah. Uh, so tell me your experience. No, what? I will not. No. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's no, a, I will. Just give me a second, okay, buddy. Take All right. your time. Take no, your time. like you said love. Yeah. Twice. Yeah. And you've probably been in love more than that. In my life? Or? Yeah. In your life. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've been in love by before that three times. Now... Wild concept. Wild, right? Yeah. Historically freighted like no other yeah. concept. Yeah. My goodness. You know, what does a person like you make of a word and a concept like love? Funny, I, I, I had a revelation about it relatively recently. I, did a, I actually did a private... I I'm did a very proud of this question, by the way. Yeah. This is one of my best questions. I just wanted, okay. So I hope you do well with the answer. Okay. So I did, a, I did a little podcast on it. Instead of blogging, I, love. I, I yeah, sometimes you know I don't like to write, so I'll just speak into a mic. Yeah. So I did one on love, oh. and I didn't popularize it because I had to figure out how I felt about it. But it, it was all it all came from a quote somebody had put on the Twitter um, from Eric Fromm, who I've never mm -hmm. read. Mm -hmm. I know the name, but it doesn't mean mm -hmm. more than that. I'm not going to pretend to know anything more than that. And it, it was something about love is not a feeling; it's, it's an action. Okay. And. I found that that's been true in all my relationships, that for the most part, um, I, I'm good at love as a verb. I'm good at, love to me is a movement of, um, this comes a lot from my Kierkegaardian training. Kierkegaard was my first major love. Um, <laughs> and, I, and it's this move to the infinite. It's this move to 
a refraction of all the sort of banalities of the everyday through the infinite. So when I first got, I, I've only been married once and I, I married uh -huh. my, my fantastic, brilliant, beautiful now ex-wife. And we never, we said we would never live together without being married. And we did. The day we moved in together, it's the day we ran up the street and eloped. Mm. Because we both knew that day-to-day -day life as a human being is repulsive. And at some point, you're going to just hate the way the person breathes. Mm. Right? You just mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. right? I get annoyed with my kid sitting here. I love my kid mm -hmm. more than anything. I, I rip my eyes out from my kid. They smell. They yeah, smell. I'm just like, dude, stop breathing like that. They're messy. Yeah. They, they, breathe, they breathe wrong. It's part of just the, being and, and the way they eat is disgusting. Yeah, disgusting. No, totally. So Take how do you, how do you, what do you do with that? So if you're not, if it's not um, refracted through the infinite, if you're just, if your horizon point is the finite, ah. then, okay, well, I don't like the way she breathes. I'm out of here. But if I'm refracted through the infinite, oh. then, oh, so she breathes funny. Oh. Right? Okay. And so, and so I was married. I was married for 14 years, very happily. Yeah. And, and, I, and so for me, it's, this, it's a constant movement. Love is an internal movement. It's Kierkegaard's language, right? It's not about love, but about faith. It's an internal movement in which you move, to the fi move from the finite to the infinite and back. That's how he defines the night of faith, his highest, his apogee of sort of, of life, of existence. It's, it's the person who, can, who, who walks through the banality of the everyday, without disdaining it okay. because those are the monks those are the people who say no no i'm gonna go i'm gonna i'm gonna disdain this life i'm gonna take an ascetic um uh, 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 uh you know vow yep and i'm not gonna speak i'm not gonna eat i'm not gonna fuck okay. them he's like okay but he kind of doesn't like those people the people who make that move to the infinite everything is through the infinite and then come back to the finite and then with each step they take they're in the finite and the infinite they don't mind they they, they relish washing dishes Mm -hmm. Not because that's the end in itself, but because that's something too. And then the infinite is this is is a kind of horizon point of of again of of, of infinity of of this endless regress. So that so that the micro sort of uh, fetishy fucking kvetches about mm -hmm. this or that action pale. Mm -hmm. Right. So she, I don't like the way she breathes. So I I see her sleeping and she's breathing, and then. If my horizon is the cosmos receding across all time and place, yeah, that's fucked. What's my problem? What if yeah. she voted for Clinton? What if she, what if she's? Oh. Um, uh, but you have to choose someone. Mm -hmm. You're choosing someone in particular, maybe maybe some people, but right? Yeah. So, you, in other words, you can apply this idea of the infinite to friendships, to anybody. Absolutely. Right? Okay. And in fact, it, it's the same. Yeah. Okay. So for you, love is choosing a particular person. Or it's, it's not that he's choosing as much as it's making a move. With, so it's a kind of choice, but yeah. I don't want to make it so rational. Well, choice has that kind of sense, but it okay. is, it is because a lot of it's how, how do you responding to it. I'm attracted as much to my male friends as my female friends. Unless I go and fuck them, but I'm attracted to them. I, I want to be around them. I like being in their world. Mostly right? me. Yeah. But so sh you, so, but you, you, how do you come to be, how, it's a choice. How do you come to choose a particular person? Or what's so saying a little bit if it's a middle voice, right? Because it's, now if I was being purely rational about it, I've chosen badly, right? Two times in a row, right? I uh -huh, yeah. basically, love with two women, both of them ended up dumping me, right? right. Or just right. not wanting really to pursue it with me. Because right. I personally, I think, well, what, yeah. how do you think you come to that point? How, how, yeah. what happens with you to get yeah, you to that point where yeah, that's, that's it's that, thank you, that's, I finally got the um, question out. Well, I feel like, you know, you size it up. So I wrote a piece on this a long time ago for Thought Catalog, and I was writing for them mm -hmm. a long time ago, and I was like, you know, it doesn't really matter who you're with, and I truly believe this, <laughs> that it's because it's the internal movement. It's not about the one. It's about, fuck, I could take any woman I've dated pretty much my entire life, and they're all... They got their good things, they got their bad things. If I really got to do a pro and con list, it doesn't work. It's really about making that internal move and, and then making the internal move back. It doesn't really fucking matter, right? All these women, they're all smart and clever and sexy in their own different ways. What if they love traveling? Yeah, so then it gets down to this very practical <laughs> thing. That's what happens, so here's what happens. You're not going to the infinite with her. Here's what happens. You're not even going traveling with her. Here's what happens to me is I get, I, this is both two women in a row, the two women I've loved since I've married, both said to me at some point, well, you're not really the activity part. I really want an activity partner. You're not an activity partner. Right. And I realize they're not, they have no idea what love is because mm. 
what the fuck do you care? You're not fracking through the infinite. You really want an activity partner? Are you fucking kidding me? Like, I'll do some things with you because we are in the finite. Uh -huh. So let's say I go camping with you one in every five times. The other four times, go with someone fucking else. Are you going to sit and read Nietzsche with me? <laughs> really? You're going to sit here and fucking do MDA and, <laughs> and, and we're going to talk about the fine points of the Luz uh -huh. while you lick my anus? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> That's my thing. Your thing is going camping. I don't... I expect you to do it sometimes, That's your thing but too. not all. That's your thing too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I don't understand. And, and if you can't give up that holding <laughs> on to that finite need, your horizon isn't there. And so that, those people, I, I made the move, but they couldn't make the move back. Which philosopher goes best with rimming is what I want to know. Like, I, let's nail that down. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no, they're all sort of didn't do that well. I, don't think I let you drink on well the podcast and this is what happens. Jesus Christ, Daniel. <laughs> So love is, it's that, it's, it's a choice though. It's choosing it's someone. It's a movement. It's a movement with a particular person though. Yes, it's an internal movement with that. And you have no idea person. why you happen to choose those two women. You must. Yeah, you get some, I think part of There's it some is. some pattern in you, something you understand about yourself, no, think, or was it just, no, think, em, was it just emergent? Was it just spontaneous? Emergent. I, think, really? I, think, I think some of them have, there's this little bit of physical chemistry, and mm. it, although both very different dynamics psychosexually but both have some sort of appeal in the psychosexual realm mm -hmm, some mm -hmm. sort of attract we just feel i mean they're just thing, they're just like your mother one of, one of the figures i'm drawn to is is magnetism and gravity right these sort of figures of attraction right Ooh. the science loves um, but i don't think they explore nearly thoroughly enough the way two bodies just go towards each other. They just do. Okay. Why do I read Deleuze, but I find Frege unreadable? Right. <laughs> I, I don't you know can't explain you. it. It's rhythmic. It's, it's harmonic convergence. It's sine waves. And it's, are you not interested in trying to explain it? That is my explanation. Is what? That it's, that it's a question of flow and rhythm. You know, you, you get in a flow and it, it was someone who doesn't flow, you, it's dissonant. But you're not, you don't want to explain the cause. You're not interested in explaining causality. In some sort of psychoanalytic sense, I, don't, I think that's a false, I think it's a red herring. Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I think the, the reasons we're attracted to some people and not others, even often at our own detriment. I mean, I was, one woman I was in love with was terrible for me. I mean, just mm. not, not nice to me at all. It was sort of a terrible, terrible. Been there, yeah. But, you know, you, you, you feel a draw. You just do it. And I didn't care because I was in that rhythm and I was willing to ride it all the way out. Mm. I didn't need to rashly step back. Yeah, I wish she was more supportive of me. I wish she... You know, like I didn't give a shit because there's another, there's another dimension, another dimension of flow, and we could psychoanalyze, but psychoanalysis is such a limited but isn't it, rubric. Isn't it just odd, though? I mean, I'm going to sound like really yeah. pedestrian here, but yeah. isn't it just odd that you know, of all the thousands or however many women and men who have come across us, you know, come just a handful, yeah. two, three, four, whatever it is, yeah. right? We have this very particular, very specific set of feelings about. Yeah. That we do not experience in any other way with anyone yeah. else yeah, ever. Totally. Yeah. And it is consistent with what the culture tells us is love. Mm. I see where we had it. But I, I don't know what's going on in my head yeah, when I fall in love. I, when I fall in love, it feels like what the culture says is falling in love. Mm. I feel like I'm doing a normal thing, mm, maybe even thing. a good thing. Yeah, and I'm yeah, wondering yeah. how much of that is causing me to have these feelings, yeah, right? That's great. Yeah, sure. Is that's that very makes, good? Yeah. That's, is that good? Yeah. I think it's pretty good. I think it's really good. And, and it, it complicates And it just, yeah. yeah, it just makes me, well, it fucks me up, right? It just makes me skeptical about what I'm doing here and what whether this feeling is really, and I, I think yeah. you just need to get in touch with you. <sighs> yeah. So, so Can, that's something I do do actually believe. I don't, I don't need some f fucking female friend to tell me that. But, right. but, actually, you told me the other day when yeah. I, was, I called you up yeah. and I was like fucked up about women and you were like, go inside. And you meant go internally. And, and, and you and I both said, the Buddhists are right about everything, right? Just, it's, because imagine the, the that. Zen, it's the a Zen great idea. thing to go for, to be in a relationship, to seek a relationship because I have a lack versus yeah. seeking a relationship out of plenitude. Yeah. Which is, right, which, is, which is common relationship advice nowadays, which right. is actually very solid, and yes. we agree with that. And there's right? something very beautiful about that. And you and I both are very inspired by Zen and, and Buddhism and yes. these insights, and that's right. When, when, the, when the people the, in the relationship are bothering you, yeah. go inside. Yeah. Yeah. 
Call, yeah. The call's coming from inside And if you out. find yourself in this position, where I have found myself here, where I'm like, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I need ego confirmation. Yep. Back to this ego thing, right? Yep. I need confirmation. Yep. I need to be loved. I need to be, des- and for me, a lot of it's desire. I have a lot of physical self-hatred. I have a lot of self-loathing, and I want to be desired. Mm-hmm. And I, I, well, if I, at least I fuck. Mm-hmm. Even, even though the sex might not even be good, even though my- Someone I wants still, to fuck someone me. Someone wants Someone me. wants to fuck me. And imagine is... finding your value yeah. in, in, a, in an economy of desire. Right. That's nice. It's it's easy. It's easy and difficult, but it's also so um, draining. Mm. It's not an economy that fuels your fuels your vitality. It's a, it, <laughs> right at desperation. You're spending so much energy seeking the thing that to then fill you. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it's a little bit of luxury of, of being now in my fifties. Mm-hmm. You know, and being like, yeah, yeah. What the fuck do I need? Mm-hmm. You know. And at my best, I am that. I'm not always that. But at my best, at my, at my best being at my healthiest, feeling healthiest, physically healthiest, psychologically healthiest, vital, self-contented, I'm not, uh, like, eh. we talked about earlier, you know, approaching women. Yeah. Right? And the nerve of that. Like, but, I, I wouldn't do it ever. Right. And there's a point I, at which one can be dependent on it. But imagine not being dependent on whether they say yes or no. I know. The men who do that, I've just, I, I'm simultaneously sort of disgusted by them, but and also in awe of them, and also envious of them. Yeah. The, the handful of men, yeah. and it's really a handful, yeah. right? Who would do, who actually approach women in bars like cold. Yeah. That's, I've never done that in my life. I can't imagine ever doing it. Thank God for dating apps, right? Yeah. But yeah, that's, um, that's something, well, Nietzsche certainly would approve of this, that kind of behavior, right? And why not, right? right. What's to lose? What's to lose? Exactly. And why do you, why do you, what, if you have that kind of self-contentment of just, you just go. Like, oh, you look nice. You, you want to get a drink? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you're a douche. Maybe I'm a douche. But how do we know until we get a drink? Yeah. And all right. So this. Okay. I do have one last question before we, before yeah. we solve the world. Yeah. The world's problems. Yeah. Um, so you've had a lot to say about the movie The Joker. Mm. Or is it just Joker? Joker. Just Joker. Um, give us the give us your your take on it because your take uh. is quite different. And yeah, funny. Than yeah. most people, um, and you thought about that movie in a while. You have a very positive take on it. Well, yeah. you know, I'm thinking it's about love, love, movie. dating, yeah. relationships, men, women. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, to me, that movie is very powerful, and it was a. It's fundamentally about for me. It was a. It, everything I've seen Tom Phillips say, I I was sort of like, yeah, that's what I take from this movie. Is that culturally, how do we? What happens to those who just simply can't make it? Mm. Right. What do you, there's a lot of people like that, and in fact is. I feel like that often too, right? I'm gonna unravel. I just want to sit in a corner and shit myself at and any, babble. At, at and any blah, minute, blah, blah, blah. we could yeah. be out in the street being schizophrenic homeless person on Market Street. Yeah, and I and I That's feel that. I've I been in too, client man. meetings. I've been in big, powerful meetings with CEOs, and I'm wondering half step away, am I about to shit myself and evacuate myself and fall on the floor babbling, and what will become of me? You too, huh? Yeah, I have the same thing. And <laughs> um, I do. Yeah, that's one of those things you bring up with a woman. They're like, they look at you like, huh? they're like, uh, maybe I'm not so attracted maybe, to you anymore. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I should have said that. Yeah, I think I swiped the wrong way on that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that movie is really just fundamental. What do you do with people who, you know, his claim is his revolution was never um, based on labor. Right, so his critique of what we might call capitalism, for lack of mm-hmm. a better word, but of, of American culture of whatever's happening, mm-hmm. um, the revolution around him, all their sons would eat the rich. But he liked his job. He had no problem with his job. He had no problem working. He had mm-hmm. never complained about that once. He loved being right. a, a, a clown. Mm-hmm. His problem was that he can't always function, and that people literally won't even look at him. That there's this power of of just being recognized as having any value whatsoever. And when you breed a culture that at some point just will not even look at you. So I've heard this is a common thing about homeless, is that they'll say, people have conversations right in front of us like we're not there. Mm. Okay. You know? And that absolute lack of a recognition of humanity. Mm-hmm. It, to me, that's a movie. That's why I was so surprised by the reactions of that movie, because it's speaking to such a basic thing. Just recognize that somebody is living. Right. And maybe needs a little help. Mm. What's so fucking wrong about that? Why do you let that person go? Because they're white men. Yeah, yeah I mean, that part. That's what it's about, right? What's funny to me, though, is that we don't the care. people that turned me on to that movie got most excited about the movie were women. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah. Really? Yeah. That's good. Um, and hope. we're most passionate about that film. And I only saw the movie from a, 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 a female, I know, a woman I know as a friend and brilliant theorist and poet and. 
She urged me to see. I, well, I want to go to see some fucking Hollywood movie. I, it never would have occurred to me to see that movie. Huh. I like Joaquin, but whatever. Wow. I'm not a big, huge fan of The Hangover. You know, like, Tom Phillips is <laughs> fine, am. but whatever. <laughs> it's fine, but I don't need to go. I don't follow the Phillips oeuvre. Right. <laughs> you know? Uh, but, but Kat in New York, you know, urged me to see it, and she was fucking right. And it really touches on, you know, and a lot of the women I know who saw it and loved it, and I made it for some female friends I know. I, Encourage them to see it. Mm-hmm. And they went and saw it, and they recognize themselves on the screen. Oh yeah, yeah. They're like that's how I feel. Oh my god, you know. Oh. And, and um, so the whole white man thing, I never really understood. I, I, it's just identity politics. Once again, going. I don't know. I don't even want to talk about because it it's so fucking awful. It's and so depressing. Yeah, yeah. It's just a, it's a wrong turn. Yeah. Okay. In every politics, I don't. I. I I know for some reason that's considered leftist politics, but it seems super right end, well, uh, right wing politics. A lot of the left is rejecting it too. Thank God. But, right. Yeah. But whatever that identity sure. politics movement yeah. seems to me super conservative. Conservative. Is uh, the super Taliban esque and super fundamentalist. I love that yes. the most radical movements alive today are the fucking uh, fundamentalists, our m- Muslims, <laughs> bombing shit, trying to take down American capitalism and identity politics. I was like, Oh right. Yeah. I, I don't where, know what happened. Where are we here. supposed to be? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how. How things got to that position? Where are the good old? Where's Allen Ginsberg? Yeah. You know, getting sucked off while talking about communism. Like, where's like, where's good-natured fucking radicals? I'm so glad you brought up the the '60s, '50s. Really, '50s Ginsberg is '50s '60s counterculture. You are a big fan of Ginsberg, Allen Ginsberg, as yeah. am I. Yeah. And this is I want to I want you to teach at least one course on the Beats and Ginsberg. You know, for Renegade yeah, University. Yeah. And Burroughs, who I don't know at all, but you're a big fan and expert on Burroughs. Um, just like briefly, like a lot of people don't know these guys, but like what's what turns you on about Ginsburg and Burroughs? Well, Ginsburg, Ginsburg's funny because I actually love him for his language. I think he's mm. I think he's just a great fucking poet. Yeah. I think he's I think it's often overlooked about him, right? It becomes a cultural icon. It comes mm-hmm. reduced to this historical signifier. Right. But he's actually a master poet. Mm. You know, the, his rhythm, I mean, is just outrageous. Just exquisite and outrageous. Um, I, I mean, I've read Howell a million times out loud, and it never ceases to amaze me, just simply what's happening with language. The level of mm-hmm. just linguistic delight. That poem, Howell by Allen Ginsberg, yeah. and I think his most much of his poetry and maybe even some of his prose has been compared to bebop jazz yeah do, yeah do you yeah, read yeah. that way 100 okay, percent. he's yeah. aware of that so he's yeah. fucking with these rhythms and just when you're in a rhythm he'll go off right he'll he'll mm-hmm. syncopate and he'll and mm-hmm. he and it's and he and it you know there's a great scene in uh david cronenberg's naked lunch mm-hmm. where they're sitting around it's the ginsburg character they're not called ginsburg but it's a ginsburg character and the Kerouac character and they're debating about editing Mm. And the Kerouac character saying, "No, man, you can't edit ever. You just gotta let it flow." Right. <laughs> and the Ginsburg character's like, "What are you talking about? I, I, I edit every line a million times, mm. you know." And I, and he's to me the prose stands for itself, right? Kerouac will, is a fine figure, but a forgotten prosist. Yeah. And Ginsburg will right. remain the master poet. I mean, just on yeah. another level of his poetry. Yeah. One of the great parts of Howl is is the second part where all of a sudden he's, he goes into holy, 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 holy asshole, holy, blah, 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 blah. everything is holy, your asshole is holy, the, everything's holy, and it's so gorgeous and it's such a um, it's it, it's it's an ecstasy, uh-huh. and so it's all of a sudden it's this mode I think you were talking about of of sixties rebellion as a kind of affective a, a, a state mm-hmm. as opposed to. Mm-hmm. This policing of actions mm-hmm. and, and the self seriousness and the sanctimony, or even the old left with its sanctimony and its yep. seriousness. Yep. And I was like, Ginsburg going, Yeah, oh, fuck, man, oh, fuck, I'm gonna you get fucked in the ass by Hell's Angels all night, tripping, shooting heroin. I love this, I hate that. I just keep going, man. I got drugs in my pubic beard, I'm busted at the border. Holy, 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 holy. His holy. body isn't everything. Yeah. His body's always there, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. Oh my God! It's gorgeous. All your yeah. paraphrasing there was his body. Yes. Right. Yes. And in the in the dirtiest, in the dirty, smelly, closest beard and ways, just and yep. loving it and smiling yep. and laughing. Mm-hmm. I saw him read a few times when I was in college. You saw him? Yeah, yeah a few times. I yeah. never saw him. And each time so we'd that. go, and we'd all get excited and talk to him. At some point, he propositioned us. He like, guys. guys you guys want to come up to my room? Every time. We never did that. We all got nervous. Like our homophobia at like wow. 19 wasn't there. Yeah. It was like, yeah, come back to my room. And I was like, yeah, fucking A, man. You know? 
Um, hmm. Burroughs is in a very different world. Yeah. You know, Burroughs, I, it, it's funny to me that they, I know that they were close and they were lovers and all that kind of stuff, but Burroughs in a whole nother, we've yet to catch up with Burroughs. Mm. You know, Burroughs was a... Tell Burroughs, me why I should read Burroughs, why I should care. Burroughs has an understanding of, of the relationship between, you know, the geopolitical state, hmm. identity, language, and ideas, and experience that makes him, first of all, function at a different, a diff in a different situation. He's not really a novelist, he's not a philosopher, he's not like Hunter Thompson, who I also love, who's, who, whose position was clear, mm -hmm. right? Hunter Thompson was clearly commenting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Burroughs is commenting, but he's inside. He's rearranging. He's creating new possible worlds. Mm. He's, he's, you know, he saw the rise of the, you know, the, the the international fascist drug state so early, and the levels of control that happened through, through the political, through the affective, through the discursive, through, you know, and his whole thing about cutting up language mm. was that language, language is this virus. It occupies us and controls us, and you literally need to break it. So he's literally inventing grammars inventing whole modes of identity that will always be multiple and very peculiar sexualities. You know, it's, let's just call him like a homosexual writer. It's so reductive because mm -hmm. the sexuality is so out there. He's fucking aliens, you know, and, and his, his, um, uh, his, his idea or his, his figures of how he constructs a, what counts as a novel. You look at his books and like, what is this? They're so sui generis. It is so, defies, belies anything you think is anything. Hmm. What is this? That was my first experience reading Burroughs. I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Where do I even begin? Is this poetry? Is this philosophy? Is this just demented dream? What is this? You know, and I think most people associate him with Naked Lunch, which is this right. kind of, it's called a fever dream, as yep. I get. Yep. But, it, you know, he got more and more sophisticated in his last trilogy. It's just on another level of what literature, ideas, language, and the relationship someone can have to ideas and culture can be. So what it is, you found, is another level of literature. Another level of literature and another level of thinking and what it means to think, this embodied thinking huh. um, that will always be, that will so aggressively refuse any terms of identification. Mm. He will never call mm. himself a libertarian. Mm. He'll never call himself, gay. you know, gay. He never does. He's just doing his fucking thing. He is an yeah, like the fucking vigil, leading this life, and partaking in chance. That's why he loved. He loved the cut up, and he loved his. You know, he loved the cut up technique, which would be cutting up uh, his own work and other people's work, and seeing what comes. Mm. In, radically introducing chance and the emergence, mm. because he never, like Nietzsche, he never separated chance from fate. You are how you roll with chance. Yep. And so he also the shotgun art, which I'm. Not so a huge fan of, but I like the idea of where he would take out, you know, a, a can of paint and take a shotgun and the canvas is behind it. Mm -hmm. But but that he's in the flow of it. Yep. He's not this adamant guy. This is my doctrine. He's in the middle. He never seeks to be outside. He's always situated in the middle, and it's ugly and grotesque and funny and dark and so just um, ribald and so vaudevillian and. It, He's like, he's, to me, I always consider Burroughs like the Chuck Jones of literature. <laughs> but Chuck Jones, you know, with ass fucking and tons of drugs. <laughs> There's been a lot of ass fucking references in this podcast. A surprising number. I don't know if iTunes is going to allow this, <laughs> yeah. or YouTube, certainly. Um, but uh, we'll yeah, edit it. My profanity, that's such a profanity, do they? Uh, you never know with them. Yeah. Okay, so um, you are going to change the world radically. A firm you're working with, as the director of communications will, specifically, uh, and you all mean it, and I think yeah. if 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 it's true what you say, you know, and this thing comes to fruition, I think you will change yeah. the world. So, and believe it or not, it's all connected to what we've been talking about. I think so too. Right? Okay. Cool. So too, yeah. Okay. So the name of the startup firm you're working with is I always forget the pronunciation. Anatha. Anatha. A N A T H A. It comes from Anatha Prindika, who was a disciple of the Buddha, oh. who uh, was a business owner. And funded tons of shit. Oh, really? And created these communities of flourishing. I didn't know that. Yes. Okay. And the head of it is a guy named Ed Hickman. Yep. Right? And you're the director of communications. Yep. Okay. So tell us how, and this is, you know, I always bust your guys' balls for not being clear yeah, about yeah. what the actual product will be. So tell us what Anatha is promising to do. 
So what we're promising to do, but also what we think the promise of mm -hmm. decentralized smart contract technology, people call blockchain, blockchain is one technology, there yeah. are other decentralized technologies, is ushering in what we call the information age, what Ed Higman calls the information age econ economy. If, if the, extract, the existing model of the economy is premised on um, oil and extraction, everything's extractive. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's always about people at the center who can extract value. How much value can I get from this user? And that's literally how our business models are done. Okay, so oil is the old economy. That's yes. The, the new economy, right? The economy is premised on information. But there's extraction, you're saying, there too. Right, and so in the existing model, okay. um, Facebook and Twitter. Google, mm -hmm. Twitter, um, and basically every company, they're extracting mm -hmm. our data. Right. And our data is who we are, but it's everything you clicked, it's everything you like, it's everything you search for, everything you all purchase. your activity, everything you purchase, everything yeah. you think about purchasing, yep. mm -hmm. everything you're doing in an online environment yep. is being monetized right. and being deployed um, they take to, your data, to sell you things. They take your data and then they sell it to other parties, sometimes the federal government. Exactly. Or other exactly. companies. Yeah, or and it's and all becomes seamless. The line, the line between okay. the sort of uh, uh, corporate, okay. corporate surveillance and, okay. and state surveillance. Is so the same no thing. one, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. That's right. just a statement of what's going on. Okay. So the premise is that, and it's a, it's a very clean premise, is that that information is yours. The, the, the premise of an author is yeah, that the it premise, should, yeah. should the premise be yours. The premise of this idea of an information age economy. It, it can and should be yours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that, yeah, yeah. that you yes, you're using somebody else's platform in a proprietary way. Yes, yeah, and okay. you're using their platform and their technology, so okay. it's not 100% yours financially, okay. mm -hmm. but that you have um, rights, financial claims on that property. That yep. is your property. Okay. And that the red herring is that they keep framing it in terms of privacy, right? And everyone says, well, I like ads served to me. I like to know. I don't, what am I protecting? Mm -hmm. But it's not a question of privacy. Privacy is a red herring. It's really about property. Okay. It's really about literally what you're owed. Okay. Right. So now imagine. So, if you look at the richest companies in the world and the and the assets that drive the most value, information has surpassed oil. Mm -hmm. Right. Apple, Facebook, Microsoft are the biggest companies in the world. Yep. Um, Google. <laughs> They've surpassed Exxon Mobil. Mm -hmm. Right. So information has surpassed oil, and yet the information is yours. Oil is coming up out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Now imagine if oil coming up out of the ground, we had said, well, who owns that? And we'd said, well, it's everybody's because it's under the ground. Mm -hmm. That all the revenue that was generated from that oil would have been distributed equally amongst everybody in the world. We could have just said we could have said that, okay. but we didn't. Yes. We said no. There's property rights, and the oil there is mine. Right. Information. Well, that's yours. So now imagine you are an a oil well. So you are literally creating value. In everything you do. The minute you go online. The right. minute you check your email, the minute you surf the web, the minute you comment, the minute you literally create content. Right. I mean, I, I, you and me, we're, look how much content we're creating for the internet. Right. It's, right? it's information that can be used and monetized and by it, others. And is used and monetized yeah. by others. Right. But we're not sharing every, any... Every click on the internet is information, exactly. right? They, there's information that I went from here to here on the internet. And that is a piece of information that can and has been used to monetize other people's Exactly, and to make the biggest ventures. companies in the world. Right. And okay. yet we, we, we're given free use of their products sometimes, mm -hmm. and we're considered that's enough. Right. And yet they're seeing profits. Okay. So the richest people in the world are Jeff Bezos. Now, how are you going to give us so property rights over our information? So the idea is to create a new economic engine. So one of the things that, that blockchain and, and smart contracts allow for is you have a, a digital identity and you go online and it's and every and everything you interact with the minute you interact with them initiates certain terms of what's called a smart contract and mm -hmm. you can agree or disagree to those terms so let's say it's a, it looks just like facebook and you're on there and someone wants your ad it wants your data to to sell you ads mm -hmm. you can opt in or opt out and it and it immediately generates revenue to you you're immediately paid there on the spot okay our existing economic tools, because they're all centralized, that's almost impossible to do. If Facebook wanted to pay us for our information, how the hell would they do it? I can't even get paid by my clients. For me to get paid by my client has to go through at least two banks, me, them, two banks, and usually a third party like Bill.com, mm -hmm. right? Or PayPal, someone yep. intermediating, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Five parties, when there should just be two parties. right? Right. Okay. So what smart contracts in the blockchain allow for is peer-to-peer -peer payment. So it allows the economic framework for immediate payment 
And it's smart contract, so it's just smart contract to mean that it, it immediately kicks into gear. It just it knows the terms and just distributes. Okay. Nobody's in control of it. It's just you've agreed to it or you haven't agreed to it, and it just simply distributes. Okay. So now imagine a, 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 a social platform or your banking, whatever you're doing, um, in which you are constantly profiting from your very activity. You are an oil well, right? You're just generating value yep. as you're creating the world. And what you, what, you're, what you shift towards, and it sounds so highfalutin, but it's actually very practical. It's an, econ it's a, it's an engineering question. Yeah. It's not that complicated. We're building it. It's, it's right there. I was going to say, so is this going to be like an interface on your computer? Yes, so it'll when, be on your phone or your computer. So when you yeah. become a member of Facebook, it will, it'll start interfacing with Facebook and say, well, Facebook, you know, all the information you have to pay me for. Right, that won't the, be Facebook. That I, that I, Facebook's that I, not giving up its stuff, I, but it'll be your, it'll be a new oh. social network. Oh, I see. So it's an okay. So it has unless to be. Facebook changes. Right, right, right. Right, and, and creates or, a UI, or, or you become big enough that yes, they, they're exactly. forced to deal with this. Exactly. So what will happen? Oh, so it, oh. we will look back in 10, 15 years, and we will see Google and Facebook as the robber barons of yes, our era. Right. They just they robbed us blind and got the fuck out of there, and they will disappear because all you have to do is think about is free market. Right. That's why. It, it's it's not we don't need government intervention. That's the beautiful part about it. Mm. Is you can just say, well, you can belong to this community that takes all your value and keeps the wealth for themselves, or you can do the exact same thing over here and get paid. Okay, so you're building a whole alternative community with its own social media yeah. platforms and, uh, in it, its own Facebooks and its own Twitters. Yes, inside of it. I see. Okay, and what we're mostly building is a the ability a, a whole for economy. anyone. To build those. A whole economy. We're trying to build an entire set of economies, so we don't want to be the only one. Gotcha. We're building the set of software. We're building our own community. Okay. But we don't really care if you join our community. Join any community. Use our software. Plug and play. Okay. And so you can just say, I want to build my community of, of registered uh, Renegade University mm -hmm. or unregistered podcast mm -hmm. or the yoga community or, right. you know. And every, every piece of information that comes from you will be monetized. For, yeah, and on, you can, on your behalf, and you can opt in or opt out. You can say, you know what? I don't want you to take any of my data. I, I don't need your money. So it's community building. So you got to do a lot of public relations. Got to do a lot of marketing. Got to get the word out. It has to be a movement. It has to be a movement. It has to be a social movement. Yeah, doesn't it? And, and 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 it's a proliferation of social movements. So the fact is, rather than right now, we have general, we have pretty much a dominant monopoly, right? The dollar on currency. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Right. But now imagine the currency is now competitive. Right. Right? That's one of the more exciting things about crypt cryptocurrency mm -hmm. is it makes currency competitive. Mm -hmm. And so why would I continue to use U.S. dollar when the way it's used for an enormous war machine, I don't really see that much benefit from mm -hmm. it. I don't, why would I continue to, I want to only use currency that fits my values. Mm -hmm. So you'll join communities and use currencies that fit your values. And you I might have it. 10 different ones. I love it. And, and there are companies like Cosmos who are building the interface between them all. So you can just flow between them. I love it. And it's, it, it really is this kind of commie anarchist, crypto pervert fantasy. Without the state, without a government. There's no state. We don't need a state at all. Yeah. Then because the state just gets in the way. If the state just backs the fuck off, this thing could really flourish. They're, they're getting in the way right now. Left Amen. And right. Now, how roads and all that still, I mean, I know that's the classic libertarian thing. How do libertarians deal with roads? Oh. That still needs to be free. We'll get to there. I'm not worried. You can build roads. Yeah, we'll yeah. get there. <laughs> yeah. We'll get there. Um, but in the meantime, it's really just beginning from this basic premise of information is yours. Um, it is being stolen from you. If you withheld that value from Facebook, the economy will crumble. Mm -hmm. If you just withheld your thing, I'm not going to go on the internet. Go on strike. Go on fucking strike. That's right. That's why I voted in for Bernie. Information uh, strike. An information strike. An information strike. You will shut down. That's right. The world's largest company. That's right. Overnight. That's right. And so imagine now. There is no information technology without information. Yeah. And we, and the red herring is we keep being told it's privacy and we all go, oh, I don't really care about privacy. Why do I care? Yeah. Do I really care? Oh, they're spying no, on me. Some people worth, really care about that. It's worth money, jackasses, is yeah. what you're saying. It's fucking property. Yeah. It's fucking property. Yeah. And that changes the entire game and it changes all the economic tools. And what you get is like oil which is fundamentally scarce. It just is right. at its core. There's only so much oil. Well, that's actually not totally true, but go ahead. But at some point we run out. Right? But you, yeah, but you can remake it. Like fracking has, you can, you can make it into a new product. So it's actually sort of infinite in itself. 
Yeah, but it's a separate issue. Information it's, is, is the Alex Epstein ep- episode. Yeah. Everyone, listen to that. I'll watch yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I would like to know more. I yeah. talk out my ass. All but the it's time. okay. No, but your basic point is. But right. information is essentially regenerative. Yes. Every yeah. time, yeah. so it's not like you've given up all your information already to Facebook. You're constantly generating new information. Right. 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 It's, your information is not just who you are and where you live. Yeah. It's everything you do, you do, everything you buy, everything you click, right. Every everywhere you, you go, say. everywhere you move, when yeah. you get married. It's everything you say and do. Just dig it. And that's been being monetized. Why shouldn't we all see the value of that? And then you shift the entire economic terms of the world into an economy of abundance in which poverty and shit like that is unnecessary. Okay. Everybody's profiting. I like it. I like it. This is the clearest I've heard it explained to me. And we've been talking about this for a while now. That's true. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not your better. fault. No, no, no. It's, it's getting better because you got to shift. The, you gotta, for me, it's always about finding the horizon point. But it's a like social, where do you begin? It's a social movement that you guys need. Yes. You need to build a social movement. So yes. you need to be on podcasts and getting the word out yeah. there. That's we're beginning to kind of... Talking have, about but it. But places like this. At the same time, yeah. you're building technology, right? So you have, you're taking time to build technology. And so anatha.com, is that the website? Anatha.io. Anatha.io, yeah. Right, which is still pretty big right now. Yeah. Again, we're not... But you, oh, just, but you just wrote a piece. Summer. You just, everybody, This is what everyone should yeah. do. Instead of going to anatha.io, go to your recent piece. Go to me, or media, there's an anatha publication on Medium, in which I was, I've written a bunch of articles. Yeah, I just wrote one, yeah, recently, which spells it out really well. So yeah. that's the one people should look at. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's good. Okay, so we did, uh, we did drugs, we did sex, <laughs> did dating. That was good. That was, uh, and, uh, and now we solved the world's uh, problems. Look at that. Just like that. And, that was easy. Yeah, a little tequila, a little beer. That's yeah. all you need. We win. Love you. What a pleasure, man. What a true delight. Always. Thank you so much. Always, always. What an honor. You're the best. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To become a member of Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. Thanks for watching.